All right, good morning and welcome. My name is Jaden Yam and I conduct my research under the direction of Dr. Michael Rischbeter. And my project was on the paleopalynology of the Eocene and Oligocene in the White River Formation of Wyoming. So before we get started, I just wanna provide y'all with an outline of where this presentation is headed. So first I'm gonna start off with the history of the Eocene Oligocene transition and how it occurred globally but then I wanna relate that to the identified polynomorphs as related to this eocene oligocene transition, but in the Douglas-Wyoming locality, um, and look at some of the changes that we saw and the significant findings in the plant taxa. But then I wanna provide y'all with a little bit of perspective and give you a modern analog of the changes that we saw in this Douglas-Wyoming locality. And finally, I want to conclude with some of the key findings and takeaways from this specific study, but also what this means for palynological reconstructions and climate transitions in general. So climate transitions show marked changes in flora and fauna. So one of these climatic transitions that occurred was this Eocene Oligocene transition that occurred approximately 33 million years ago. So this image is a reconstruction of this greenhouse world of the Eocene. So this epoch was known for its temperate and moist climates that were dominated by tropical and subtropical rainforest, as you can see here. But as the greenhouse world gave way to the icehouse world of the Oligocene, a global climate transition occurred. So the world transitioned to a cooler, drier climate that was going to be dominated by grasses and other herbaceous taxa. So this reconstruction just shows the stark contrast to the one previous with obvious vegetational changes. So that would include things like the loss of exotic woody taxes, but also the increase in xeric shrublands and grasses that were better adapted to this cooler, drier climate. And another thing I'd like to point out about these reconstructions is that they were most often done based on the presence of vertebrate fossils. So while there were the presence of these vertebrate plant or these vertebrate fossils, we specifically wanted to look at the plants. And because of the preservation in this Douglas locality, very few plant megafossils were preserved, so we relied on the pollen and spore data. So pollen and spores are able to be preserved better because they contain spore pollen, which are resistant to this degradation and allow for the persistence in these types of sediments. So this Eocene Oligocene transition has been seen in other nearby localities such as Colorado and Nebraska. Um, and the cooling seen in these localities have been correlated to Antarctic glaciation. So this is where the expansion of Antarctic ice caps caused changes in the ocean circulations and contributed to this cooling trend of approximately five degrees Celsius. And this climatic cooling is what caused these vegetational and faunal changes that we're seeing in different localities. So the figure to the left just shows the stratigraphy of this White River formation in Wyoming. And this red line delineates this Eocene Oligocene transition as it occurred approximately 33 million years ago. So as it continues to this figure on the right, which shows the White River Badlands near Douglas, Wyoming, you're going to see an obvious demarcation in the rock strata. So this white ash layer has been absolutely dated to 33.8 million years ago, which coincides once again with that Eocene Oligocene transition. So sediments and samples found below this white ash layer will be from the Eocene, and then samples above this white ash layer would be correlated to the Oligocene epoch. So while other localities have more information based on the vertebrate fossils and plant megafossils, Eastern Wyoming and Douglas show a gap in this knowledge from this lack of plant megafossils. So to bridge this gap, we analyzed pollen and spore samples from stratigraphic sequences of this White River formation and identified ecologically significant plants that were living when these worldwide climates were changing from warm and wet to cooler and drier. And our hypothesis was that if climatic conditions were changing, then the pollen and spores would also be changing to reflect these new plant groups that were moving into this formation and emerging and becoming dominant flora. So to provide y'all with a little bit of the methodology, this image just shows once again, this White River Badlands near Douglas, Wyoming. So these sediment samples were collected from the White River Formation, which um, spans approximately 250 vertical meters. Um, and they were collected by Dr. Rishbeter in past years, but also by Dr. Kent Sundell from Casper College. 
as I was unable to travel out to Wyoming this summer due to COVID restrictions, they ended up sending samples that they collected from systematic stratigraphic sequences. And then we were able to collect them here in Clinton and send them off to Global Geo Labs. So this just shows the basic stages of palynological processing as performed by Global Geo Labs. So once we received the samples, we then sent them off to Global Geo Labs so that we would be able to view the pollen and spores found in these sediments. So just to go over the brief methodology of this basic palynological processing, once they received our sediments, they would be processed and demineralized using hydrofluoric acid to remove carbonates, silicates, and other inorganic remnants from the sediments. From there, they would be macerated to extract and concentrate the palynomorphs using oxidants and alkalis to separate the extraneous minerals. And finally, they were then stained so that the pollen and spores could be mounted on microscope slides and then viewed for us. So once we received these samples, we were able to image them on a microscope and view them and then count them for relative abundance and distribution data that we'll look at a little bit further. But this figure shows what we would have been seeing and what we did see. So this figure just shows the breadth of the pollen and spore data that we found. So of approximately 102 taxa found, 52 were identified to the lowest taxonomic level, namely the FANA family, but even more specifically to the genus and sometimes the species. And this was done by comparing them to various palynological publications um, from this similar epics, but also similar localities. Furthermore, 556 total were counted for quantification purposes that we'll look at a little bit further in the rest of the presentation. But of those identified, the 27 seen on this slide were determined to be significant climate indicators. Um, so the first grouping is going to be of the gymnosperms, and that would include species like pine, spruce, and ephedra. The middle grouping is going to be angiosperms, so think flowering plants, and that would be represented by things such as asters, birch, alder, grasses, elms, maples, things of that nature. And then this final grouping is the lower vascular plants, so things like ferns and fern allies. So most specifically for this study, we use the fern spores as moisture indicators. So this is a more visual representation and breakdown of the pollen spore distributions from the previous slide. So from here, you can see that the angiosperms in the orange dominated this locality and accounted for 63% of the pollen, which is why you saw such big grouping in the previous slide. From there, gymnosperms were the next largest group in the blue and accounted for 31% of the pollen. And then in the gray, that was the fern and lower vascular plants, which was the smallest group and accounted for only 6% of these spores. So in examining this data, we were once again seeing this angiosperm dominance of approximately 60%. So this signified increased diversity in the angiosperm pollen and the potential for more of these warm adopted taxa that we'll look at a little bit further in the relative abundance data. So this is that relative abundance data of key pollen taxa, namely TCT, pine, spruce, abies, which is fir, um, AP dicots, which is arboreal dicot pollen, and then NAP dicot pollen plus ephedra, so that NAP plus ephedra. And these were identified as key pollen taxa in various palynological publications. So for comparison and consistency's sake, we decided to similarly use these groupings. So the y-axis reflects these key pollen taxa groups, as I previously discussed, and then the x-axis reflects these pollen percentages. So once again, this was done based on those 556 pollen spores that we quantified. So our data is represented in the yellow bars on this graph. And once again, that would be the Douglas Wyoming locality. And our data was most similar to the Antero formation of Colorado as seen in the gray and orange bars. The Antero locality was from Colorado and it was most similarly dated to our sediments at approximately 33.7 million years ago, which accounted for some of the similarities seen in the pollen percentages here. But then we wanted to further contrast this with the pitch pinnacle locality, which was similarly found in Colorado, but it was younger by approximately one to two million years, which is counting for some of the differences you've seen in these blue bars of the pitch pinnacle locality. 
So some of the most notable differences and findings that we wanted to point out is once again, this angiosperm dominance that we previously discussed. So that angiosperm dominance is going to be able to be seen in the groups AP dicots and NAP plus ephedra. So arboreal dicot pollen and non-arboreal dicot pollen. Um, and from this, we saw that our data had a 15 to 20% higher percentage as compared to the pollen counts from the entire localities. So we saw that our data had a unique signature and it was helpful in understanding the similarities and the differences in the elevation and environment from Wyoming and Colorado. But also we saw that Wyoming was experiencing these different climatic conditions, which are observed in these pollen percentages that we identified. Another key difference that we saw was this lack of Aves pollen. So Aves is fur. So our data showed less than 1% as opposed to approximately 10% that has been reported in other nearby localities and publications. So since Aves or fur is generally identified as this cold adapted taxa, the lack of this Aves pollen suggests a warmer environment. And similarly with other cooler adapted taxa like hemlock. So the pollen and spore data indicated an environment that was warm with moderate rainfall. And that was similarly supported by the presence of these extreme side elements like this alder and birch, willow even, but also by the lack of significant cool indicators like that ABs pollen that had less than 1% and the lack of hemlock support this idea of a warmer moist environment. And then similarly, the presence of fern spores point to this moist environment. So in looking at this angiosperm dominance that we identified previously, we believe that it suggests a unique microenvironment for this Douglas Wyoming locality. Um, so this figure to the left shows the Douglas locality within the White River Formation. So the White River Formation is seen in this crosshatch patterning. If you look at the red star, it occurs slightly south of this river, which is that North Platte River. So we believe that the proximity to this ancient North Platte River could have accounted for some of this shielding effect that we see from this dryland deposition that occurred in other localities such as Colorado to the south and Nebraska to the east. Um, and this shielding could have allowed for more of these warm adapted taxa to survive and thrive. So to put this all in perspective, we wanted to provide a modern analog for the environment that we identified at this Douglas locality and almost provide our own reconstruction. So this is an image of Musgrove Mill here in Clinton, South Carolina, as we know it. Um, so here in this image, you can see that there are small ferns lining the banks of this water, which would be analogous to that ancient North Platte River and those fern spores that we found um, pointing to this moist environment. In the background, you can see several beech trees, which is alluding more to this temperate climate as opposed to the cooler, drier climate. And similarly, you see the presence of small herbaceous taxa and grasses, but not to the extent seen in the previous reconstruction of the Olga scene. So this is that previous reconstruction. And once again, these differences in these reconstructions are stark given the lack of warm adapted plants. So while we did find evidence of these grasses in xeric shrublands, it was not to the extent found in this image. Once again, our findings were more representative of a moist tempered environment that was seen in the Eocene. So the major conclusions that we found were that global climate changes were occurring during this Eocene and Oligocene. So the palynological studies could be used to inform how past environments were impacted. So by looking at the past environments and the pollen and spores from this Eocene Oligocene transition, we can kind of fast forward forward in the event that other global climate changes occur, whether it's warmer or cooler. Similarly, the prior, prior research with vertebrates and plants reflected changes from warm adapted to cooler adapted taxa, but our data showed this continuation of this warmer moist environment. So instead of seeing this more dramatic um, change in the plant taxa, we saw continuation of this warm moist environment that we believe is due to the proximity to the ancient North Platte River and that shielding of the dry land deposition. Furthermore, the pollen and spores identified in this study indicated that Douglas formation of Wyoming 
was not experiencing the same level of environmental change. So as the world was experiencing this climate transition that accounted for this cooling event and seen in other localities like Colorado and Nebraska, there was this non-uniform changes that were seen in this Douglas Wyoming locality. Again, attributed potentially to the proximity to the ancient North Platte River, but also to that shielding effect. So I'd like to thank my mentor, Dr. Rishbeter, and the support of the Presbyterian College Summer Fellows Program, but also the Department of Biology for funding this research. I'd like to thank Ms. Rishbeter, as well as Dr. Kent Sundell, Global Geo Labs, and Bobby Martin from Martin Microscope in providing us with these samples and allowing us to be able to view them for this kind of virtual research experience that I had. Thank you.